and world news tonight. On alert. The flood situation remains grim in Assam as hundreds of people are displaced in the state's Barpeta district. Security breach. Former US President Donald Trump heard on audio tape discussing classified Iranian documents. Wagner mutiny. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko confirmed that the head of Wagner paramilitary group, Yevgeny Prokhozin, has arrived in the country. Just Dance. Just Dance hailed as the world's top music video game featured in the inaugural Olympic Esports Week. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and you are watching World News Tonight. We are turning to India at the outset of today's news broadcast as the Salem floods proved to be life-threatening for North East India. Nearly half a million people in North East India have been affected by severe flooding after heavy rains battered the region, turning roads into rivers and submerging entire villages, compelling people to rebuild their lives from scratch. People in India's northeastern flood-ravaged Assam state have been forced to rebuild their lives from rubble. In the Bajali district, flood victims gathered at a relief shelter on Tuesday with the scarce amount of belongings that they were able to hang on to. Nabajoti Telugda says he now has to start from zero after losing his home. Meanwhile, in Barpeta district of the state, residents were seen struggling to wade through waist-deep floodwaters. The death toll there rose to at least five since Monday, while around 3,000 locals took shelter in relief camps. Heavy monsoons are a yearly occurrence in Assam, resulting in flooding and landslides, which force residents to flee their homes, often leaving behind their belongings. In neighboring Pakistan, at least 13 people have been killed and 17 others injured in rain-related accidents over the past 24 hours, the Provincial Disaster Management Authority said in a statement on Monday. Further heavy rain and dust thunderstorms are predicted across the week, Pakistan Meteorological Department said. The country's monsoon season usually begins in the first week of July, lasting until mid-September. Belarusian leader Lukashenko have confirmed Wagner Group chief Prekozin is now in Belarus following a short-lived insurrection against Russia. Lukashenko says the troops are welcome to stay in his country. According to Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko, Wagner chief Yevgeny Prigozhin arrived in Belarus after leading a brief mutiny against Russia. A private jet owned by Prigozhin was reportedly seen landing in Minsk on Tuesday morning with aircraft tracking site Flight Radar 24 confirming that the aircraft had landed in Belarus. The news comes after the Wagner chief was exiled as part of a three-party deal between Russia, Wagner and Belarus. The Belarusian leader also added that he convinced Russian President Vladimir Putin not to destroy the Wagner Group and its chief. Meanwhile, Moscow announced Tuesday that it had closed its criminal investigation into the armed rebellion led by Prigozhin, with no charges to be handed to any of the participants of the weekend insurrection. According to the Federal Security Service, its investigation found that those involved in the incident seized activities directed at committing the crime. Despite President Putin branding those involved as traitors, the Kremlin promised not to prosecute Prigozhin and others after the mutiny ended on Saturday. In Russia, anyone found guilty of mounting an armed mutiny faces a sentence of up to 20 years in prison. With the possibility that the Wagner mercenary group could regroup in Belarus, nearby countries like Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, which are close to the Ukrainian-Belarus border, as well as Poland, seem to have no choice but to pay close attention to any movements by Wagner. While Belarus has made it clear that it has no intention of participating in the war in Ukraine, watchers say it's difficult to predict how the situation will change now with Wagner and its chief in the country. Former President Trump and Florida Governor DeSantis held dueling campaigns events in New Hampshire as each filed for the Republican presidential nomination in 2024. God bless New Hampshire and God bless America. Thank you. The battle for New Hampshire intensifying in the Republican primary. GOP frontrunners Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis hosting dueling events just 40 miles apart. 
He's holding an event right now to compete with us. There's only one problem. Nobody showed up. DeSantis at a town hall asking voters to move on from the drama surrounding Trump's 2020 defeat. If this election is about Biden's failures and our vision for the future, we are going to win. If it's about relitigating things that happened two, three years ago, we're going to lose. New Hampshire's first in the nation primary, a critical test for both candidates. We want to thank the people of New Hampshire. In 2016, New Hampshire gave Donald Trump his first primary victory, helping lift him over a crowded GOP field and march to the Republican nomination. Seven years later, Trump's support in the Granite State still rock solid. A New Hampshire poll out today shows Trump leading DeSantis in the state by 28 points. Somebody said, how come you only attack him? I said, because he's in second place. Well, why don't you attack others? Because they're not in second place. But soon, I don't think he'll be in second place, so I'll be attacking somebody else. New Hampshire Republican voters we spoke to excited about the possibility of a second Trump term in the White House. A candidate new to the campaign? with an embarrassing air. Republican Miami Mayor Francis Suarez in a radio interview with Hugh Hewitt fumbling a foreign policy question about the Muslim minority group being persecuted in China, the Uyghurs. Will you be talking about the Uyghurs in your campaign? What, the what? The Uyghurs. What's a Uyghur? Okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, let me, you won't be, you okay. gotta get smart on that. Suarez releasing a statement to try and clean things up, saying, of course, I am well aware of the suffering of the Uyghurs in China. They are being enslaved because of their faith. I didn't recognize the pronunciation my friend Hugh Hewitt used. That's on me. Critics seized on the latest Trump tape as a perfect example of why the twice impeached, twice indicted former president is unfit to return to the Oval Office. An audio recording in which former U.S. President Donald Trump appears to acknowledge keeping a classified document after leaving the White House has been obtained by U.S. media. It's likely to be key evidence in the criminal case against Donald Trump. A newly released audio recording dating back to 2021 appears to reveal the former U.S. president showing off a highly classified document to visitors at his golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey. This was done by the military, given to me. Uh, I think we can probably, right? I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, we'll have to try to figure out a, a, yeah. See, as president, I could have deed-less. Yeah. Uh, now I can't, you know, but this is Yeah, now, now we have a problem. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It's so cool. I do. Trump is under federal indictment for illegally keeping 31 classified national security documents and conspiring with an aide to obstruct government efforts to retrieve them. Among them, the document referred to in the recording, believed to be a plan for a preemptive U.S. attack on Iran prepared by America's top military official. The newly released audio appears to contradict what the former president told Fox News in an interview last week, that all documents in his possession upon leaving office had been declassified by him and that he had been referring to newspaper and magazine clippings at Bedminster. The U.S. Justice Department has requested Trump's trial in the case be postponed from August to December. Cambodian authorities burned 5.7 tons worth of seized illegal drugs at a ceremony in the capital of Phnom Penh. According to the police reports, the drugs included cocaine, heroin and crystal meth, among other illegal addictive substances which were seized by authorities from mid-2022 until recently. The ceremonial burning of the seized drugs was done to mark International Day Against Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking or World Drug Day, which was actually internationally observed on the 26th of June. Due to the busy schedule of Cambodian Interior Minister Sar King and other officials who were in attendance at the burning, the ceremony was pushed to today. According to Cambodian government websites, Cambodia has no death sentence for drug traffickers, but an offender found guilty of trafficking more than 80 grams of illegal drugs in Cambodia can be jailed for life. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Welcome back. 
Japan's release of wastewater from the destroyed Fukushima nuclear power plant is apparently imminent as the country begins final stage preparations. The IAEA is also expected to release its final report on the safety of the wastewater deemed a critical stage in getting international consent. Despite concerns from several nations, Japan is pressing ahead with plans to release wastewater stored at the Fukushima nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean, with a start date imminent. The water became contaminated following a meltdown in 2011 at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant caused by a massive earthquake. Japan has since then been working on plans to treat and dilute and release the wastewater through an underwater tunnel under the watchful eye of the International Atomic Energy Agency. On Tuesday, the Tokyo Electric Power Company completed a test operation of the roughly one kilometer long underwater tunnel through which the treated wastewater will flow for the next 30 years. And starting Wednesday, the country's Nuclear Regulation Authority will start a four-day overall inspection of the plant, after which a certificate of examination will be issued, the final green light for the water release. Japan does still need to wait for a final report from the IAEA on the safety of the wastewater, which is expected early next week. But no challenges are expected, as the IAEA Director General Rafael Mariano Grossi already stated in April of 2021 that Japan's chosen method is both technically feasible and in line with international practice. The advanced liquid processing system, which is used to treat the water, removes most of the radioactive substances in the water except tritium. The final dilution process at the plant will lower tritium levels to below 1 40th of government standards before the water is released into the ocean. One last hurdle standing in the way of the Japanese government's call to begin the release is local fishing communities that have been staging fierce protests, not only over concerns about safety, but also damage to reputation. British supermarket bosses rejected allegations they were profiteering through a cost-of-living crisis, telling lawmakers they were not passing on cost rises in full to customers in order to remain competitive. British supermarket bosses on Tuesday rejected allegations they were profiteering through a cost-of-living crisis, telling lawmakers they were not passing on cost rises in full to customers in order to remain competitive. Soaring food inflation has contributed to the biggest squeeze on living standards in Britain since records began in the 1950s. Food prices jumped by 18.7% on the year in May. It has all prompted questions about who is responsible for record jumps in grocery bills. Labour MP Ian Lavery questioned executives from Tesco, Sainsbury's, Morrison's and Asda. It's being described by Sharon Graham, the... Uh... General Secretary of the United Union that uh, the, the biggest supermarkets in the UK are engaged in, and I'll, I'll quote, grotesque display of profiteering at this time, at a time when millions of workers are struggling simply to put food on the table. What do you say to that? Tesco's commercial director responded to the allegation. We make, and this is the whole group, four pence in every pound, um, which I don't think is a any example of profiteering. We really, without customers and without their trade, there is no Tesco. Um, and we have doubled down yeah. on our competitiveness. Sainsbury's commercial director also responded. We make less than three pence in the pound. Uh, we've also seen profits step back. And as I said earlier, the input cost pressures that we've had have not been reflected in full shelf edge prices so we're doing absolutely everything we can we really understand how much customers and also colleagues are struggling your group profits have gone up labor mp darren jones put it to tesco that its group profits have jumped from two billion dollars before the health crisis to over 2.5 billion dollars now you've got more cash in the bank at the end of the day uh, based on your reported accounts. Our profitability has hovered between 3 to 4 percent. As I say, the profits year on year for the group, for the group business are, are down. The supermarket bosses argued their industry did not need an intervention because it was already highly competitive. UK food prices are still rising rapidly, but not quite as sharply as in recent months. A French police officer is being investigated for homicide after shooting dead a 17-year-old in the Paris suburb of Nantre after the youth failed to comply with an order to stop his car.
When 17-year-old Niall started to drive away during a police traffic check, it cost him his life. An eyewitness filmed the police performing the check, one pointing a gun at the driver. When Niall began to leave, the officer fired, killing the teenager. The police's original version of events claimed that the driver tried to hit the officers, but videos showed them beside the car, holding the driver at gunpoint, threatening to shoot. The victim's family will be pressing charges. One of the officers is now in custody for homicide. The investigation will be handled by the General Inspectorate of the National Police, a special branch of the police force dedicated to investigating their colleagues. The incident raises questions about the role and accountability of an armed police force which resorts to firearms more often than, for instance, its German neighbours. Of course, refusal to cooperate cannot be accepted, but it's also unacceptable for police officers to fire at point-blank range on young men and women, whatever the driver's age. We must respect the grief of the families, but also the officer's presumption of innocence. Incidents of police shooting at vehicles has risen since the rules were relaxed in 2017, allowing officers to open fire if a fleeing vehicle poses a danger to public safety. South Korean government efforts continue to crack down on individuals and institutions involved in North Korea's illicit fundraising for its hostile weapon ambitions. According to the government reports, a Russian national of Korean descent and his related entities are the latest to be sanctioned. South Korea has slapped sanctions on a former South Korean national for helping North Korea in its illicit financial activities. The foreign ministry on Wednesday announced that the government imposed sanctions on Choi tong a Russian national of Korean descent. He becomes the first individual of South Korean origin to be targeted with such sanctions by the South Korean government. Choi is accused of being involved in illegal financial activities, joint ventures, and violating UN Security Council sanctions against North Korea from the time he became a Russian citizen. Two companies are also on the fresh list of sanctions. One of them is a front company established by Choi in Mongolia to evade sanctions while supporting Pyongyang's illegal funding. The other is a trading company in Russia founded by Choi and the Vladivostok representative of the North Korean Foreign Trade Bank, which is under UNSC sanctions. The trading company as well as its North Korean representative were added to the blacklist in line with a number of UNSC resolutions prohibiting the establishment and operation of joint ventures or partnerships with North Korean organizations and individuals. The foreign ministry said that blocking access to Tre's finances is expected to have a practical effect. Our government's independent sanctions against Che chong gon and his North Korean helpers will serve as an opportunity to limit violations of sanctions against North Korea and raise serious awareness. Permission from the governor of the Bank of Korea or the Financial Services Commission is required in order to conduct financial transactions with those on the sanctions list, with those who fail to comply facing punishment under relevant laws. The latest sanctions are the ninth round to be put in place against Pyongyang since the beginning of the Yoon administration. Since October last year, South Korea has targeted 45 individuals and 47 institutions. Welcome back. For more news, let's take care on the world in a minute. The International Olympic Committee is set to unban North Korea from participating in the Benayal Games, potentially opening the door to sports diplomacy at the 2024 Summer Olympics in Paris. A humpback whale was freed from a sharp neck off Australia's Gold Coast. The whale was caught during peak migration season, which sees thousands of mammals swimming north in search of warmer waters. A house on the verge of collapse, roaring waterfalls and flooded communities are the result of the heavy rains that continue to ravage central Chile, which have left two people dead and four missing, authorities reported. Sierra Leone's president, Mada Bio, was sworn into a second term after the country's electoral authority certified his victory at the polls over the protest of rivals. British-born actor Julian Sands, 65, best known for his role in the Oscar-celebrated film A Room with a View, was confirmed dead five months after he went missing while out for a hike in snow-covered mountains of South California.
That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Adaderna English. We finish off in Singapore with Olympic Esports Week. Just Dance was recognized as the world's top music video game among 10 disciplines was featured in the finals. Good night and have a great rest of the day.